So I think let's get started. Uh, who wants to go first? Happy to. Okay. Sure. All right, um, my name is Amber Manfrey. I'm a candidate for supervisor in the fourth district here in Napa County. And uh, I am a fifth generation Napan. I'm also a scientist. I have a doctorate in geography and my specialty is landscape change. Landscape change is the study of how trends occur on our landscapes and why they occur. So it might be natural causes, it might be human causes, but it's looking at the rate of change and where you get certain outcomes and why. And I think those are some really relevant topics to put to use for planning in Napa County. I think I have a lot of skills to bring to the job. I'm a professional cartographer, and, uh, and I love what I do. It's really fun. I love getting in and messing with tables and data and statistics to try to figure things out. And um, I also love to listen to people and learn. I'm a continuing learner. I'm sure I will be my whole life. So um, this process has been really wonderful. I came into it with a certain set of skills, and. Uh, and I've also learned a whole lot already just in the last few months talking to hundreds of people about what their primary concerns are here in the county. So um, for me, uh, I'm really very ready to deal with the climate crisis. I'm very ready to deal with the biodiversity crisis that the planet's facing. And Napa being a biodiversity hotspot, I think we can do a lot of good work here. Um, I'm also very concerned about housing, affordability in the county, and traffic, all those things. And I think they need to be solved through a lens of looking at climate and looking at water supplies and uh, not dealt with as if they aren't connected. So that's, uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from generally and who I am. And I'll be staying late if you want to ask me questions at the end. Oh, Jessica, thank you for inviting me. We built, we've advertised this forum from 6.30 to 8.00. We have this room. 8:45, pretty much 8:30. We have to put the room back the way it was. So if you want to stay a little longer, you want to talk to them individually. If they have the time, any of the time, please feel free to stay in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Gregory, District Two Supervisor. This is the first forum I've been invited to, so thank you very much. Um, I'm three years into my first term as District Two Supervisor, um, and I had the pleasure of running on a post for my next term. So I can't wait to get to work and have uh, five more years to, to do the things I'm working on. Um, prior to this, I was a civil engineer. For those that don't know me, I worked about 20 years in that field. My niche was uh, residential construction, building mm -hmm. residential projects, market rate subdivisions, uh, riverfront mixed use to affordable housing projects. That's what I did for a career. Um, I came into this job, that was, that was my biggest focus because you know what I saw most of the time is that the things that were in the way of getting housing built was government whether it was policy or taking too long or process, time is money. And so uh, I came in uh, with, that, with that lens and got to work. Um, proud to say that we, and you guys know this, but we all, I'm sure many of you voted for it, the 1% TOT increase, the first piece of new TOT that's going to housing, dedicated to housing. It's a big deal, $5 million more a year we have that we didn't have before for housing. Um, so a lot of us were involved with that campaign, raised money, and, and it wasn't as easy as you'd think it would be. Uh, because tourists pay this thing, right? Um, we also, uh, um, I spent all, most of last year as chair of the board uh, pushing for a new approach to our next housing element planning. Many of you know that process, but um, our next housing elements are due uh, next year. And rather than work on them separately as separate jurisdictions, we formed a what's called a subregion. And we all just did that, not all of us, uh, City of American Canyon, Napa, Napa County, and Tampa. So we'll be regionally planning our next housing cycle um, and working together on it instead of separately. And I think you'll see pretty significant gains doing it that way instead. Lots more to say, but I'll, uh, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good evening. My name is Celia Ramos, and I am your fifth district supervisor. Like my colleague Ryan Gregory, I'm on my third year of my first term. And it has been an absolute pleasure to serve all of you as your supervisor. One of the things that brought me to the county in 2016 when I ran was a deep concern for our quality of life. I am a single mom. I have three kids. I grew up in St. Helena. I lived in Berryessa Estate. My family moved to Napa. And the only place I can afford is American Canyon. I am a renter. I have zero prospect of being a homeowner. And it was that deep concern for our affordability and seeing families that have been here for generations moving out and moving south 
that brought me to the Board of Supervisors. During that time serving on the board, I have taken the chance, taken the risk of doing things a little bit differently. I was the first person as chair to not state what my goals were for me personally as chair, but to instead push forward a strategic planning process that I'm proud to say that the board fully supported and we have a three-year plan in place that we are executing upon. To think about things in a different way, to be more regional and collaborative, supporting a regional climate committee to address a regional climate reduction, climate goals for us, because together we can do it better, making sure that we have a seat at the table at the Greater Association of Bay Area Governments, where I get to serve as your vice president, advocating for housing policy, meaningful housing policy changes. And I look forward to continuing to challenge ourselves in listening to each other and bringing creative solutions towards our traffic and our housing and affordability crisis that we have here. Thank you so much for being here. So unfortunately, like I said, Marion couldn't be here. Maybe that's me. So, um, but, but you did send something, so I'm gonna have Jan read this to you. This may turn out to be fun. I might actually run for supervisor. <laughs> okay, good evening everyone. Thank you for being here tonight and being engaged in the civic process. And thank you to Napa Vision 2050 and Get a Grip on Growth for hosting this very important forum. I apologize for not being here tonight as I've been called to perform the very duties of which I am entrusted and elected to do by my constituents. My name is Mariam Abu Damas, and I am currently a city council member in American Canyon. I just finished up a term as vice mayor and am now running for the Napa County Board of Supervisors in District 5. I am also an attorney practicing law in the Napa courts. I practice in the realm of immigration and construction defect litigation. I am running for Napa County Board of Supervisors because I was raised in this community and I generally care about its future. Furthermore, I have never been the kind of person to sit around and wait for things to get done. My dad raised me to roll up my sleeves and do it myself. As an elected official, accessibility and accountability are important to me. I want to hear what you have to say and I want to be your voice. My top three issues have been and will continue to be traffic, housing, and economic <coughs> development. Of course, at the forefront of these issues is always the environment. Growing up my entire life, my dad made us plant a tree on Earth Day every year, and it is something that he still continues to do, but that's not enough. We need to take better care of our environment. First, we need to change the way that we think of development. We need higher density housing in urban cores centered around transit. We need to get as many cars off the road as possible. It has been proven that climate change disproportionately affects those who are most vulnerable because they are the ones spending so much time on the roads. We must improve our public transportation systems and incentivize commuters to use them. In 2016, I worked on the Measure AA campaign, which was a nine county ballot initiative to restore Bay Area wetlands. Wetlands serve as a natural barrier against flooding. This is one example of why restoration of natural climate systems is so important. Measure AA also provided funding for the Bay Trail connectivity. In American Canyon, we have been working hard to make our town more walkable and bikeable. We need to take action on climate change. We also need to consider making a shift to a waste, to an energy uh, economy, and develop facilities to be able to use our organic waste, agricultural waste, and timber waste for en energy. Composting of uh, residential food waste should be available all over the county and not just in certain areas. I want to be your Napa County supervisor because I want to ensure a high quality of life in Napa County that is sustainable for the many generations to come. Thank you. Okay, so now we have start the questions from the audience. So there's one question that I will start with um, that I've used in other forums and it's, it's, it's kind of the, the, the magic wand. Imagine that you have the ability, you don't need two other votes, you don't need to work with the cities or the state or anybody else, you have the power. In this climate crisis that we're, this is the, this is, 
Everybody keeps saying this is the decade that we need to take action. So question to each of you is, what one thing would you do if you had the power all by yourself to change? That's the question. Since you started it, no, why, don't you, I'm gonna have, why don't you pick the mic up so that <laughs> One thing to address, that's right, climate, yeah. our climate crisis. That's right, and you have the power to do it. You don't need any, anybody else's votes. You don't need anybody else's coordination. You're just a powerful, you're the super leader right now. What would you do and why? I would make sure that the regulations and the, and the obstacles that people currently face both in terms of accessibility and affordability for renewable energies are, are done away with. And that would include making sure that um, all can afford to drive electric vehicles, that all people can afford to have solar on their homes and that they can afford to also uh, switch over to a deep green, um, to deep green through uh, Marin Clean Energy, through NCE, making sure that the obstacles, and especially the economic obstacles, are not present. I personally had the opportunity, with the help of my parents, to switch to an electric vehicle this year. It was the best decision I have ever made. It was easier than I thought, um, but for the economics of it. And thankfully, I had the support of my family to be able to make that change, and I hope that others would be able in the future to also have those economic barriers removed so that they can turn to, ele to electric, electric cars and renewable energy sources. Okay, just a reminder, you have a minute and a half. Now our timekeeper is being quiet, so I'm obviously staying within that time. Thanks. <laughs> so two things. First, I, I'd start with the governor. Uh, I would know him. Probably he'd be, my, he'd be my best friend, uh, if, if I, if, and, and I'd go to him and I'd say, you need to provide us the tools to be successful in climate action planning. Uh, it's still elective. None of us have to do it. We're one of the few counties that, that attempted to try it, and it's taking a long time, as you guys know, uh, and we've converted now to looking at it regionally and trying to work on it with our city partners instead. Um, the governor needs to give us tools, and he needs to tell us what can be in it, um, and give us some, uh, some uh, law to back it up. It's very difficult to do it right now. Look at Sonoma County that built a really robust climate action plan and got sued and sat there for two years. Mm -hmm. So we need help from the governor, and, and he and I are buddies. Well, we're not, but if I had my way, <laughs> okay, that's the one. And I, just to echo what uh, Belia said, Supervisor Patricia Ramos said about the electric conversion, it's, uh, it's big. There was so much talk about being clean fuels for a while, CNG, LNG. Then there's, then there's diesel three by 33, what is it? Now it's, you know, converting to a electric, all electric by a certain date. Um, how are we gonna do that with, with a lot of money that we don't have? And so I would have all the money in the world and I would spend it on that. So I say, we have the power to do that, great. Amber. Okay, um, good, uh, good points um, from both of you. So I think that if I could do one thing, it would be actually, fully updating the climate action plan to reflect the information we now have. The, the current plan was drafted over a decade ago, I believe, and, uh, and we have a lot more information now. I think that regional, um, looking at things regionally and planning together with adjacent counties is also really important. Um, so one of the things that I see as a scientist who spent a lot of time studying climate change and what it's likely to cause here is that um, it's going to cause all the weather disruptions that we often think about, but it's going to cause huge economic disruptions here in Napa County. We have a lot invested in a very narrow band of industries in wine and tourism. And as we've observed, when there's a big fire, um, even when there's an earthquake, uh, and also if there's a drought or if there's um, very, very heavy rains that cause erosion and troubles with land management, all of those are dis disruptive to the economy. Even if you just get rain at the wrong time, it can really mess up the crop, right? Or freeze at the wrong time. So as we're likely to have a lot more erratic weather, I think we need to start looking at diversifying our economy so that we have a more robust um, system to bounce back from in those kinds of conditions. Uh, and I've only got a couple seconds, but, um, but yeah, I think that we need a, a plan that integrates uh, water quality. Um, groundwater is really important um, because that's our go-to in droughts and 
uh, and looking at habitat connectivity and where it's appropriate to have development and where it's not uh, in a systematic way and also looking across county boundaries for that. Okay, now we have a question that comes from the audience here. Um, and the concern is, and this is an air quality question, or I guess concern, and it is about the burning of the vines, which is very topical because if you go up and down the valley, you will see many of them wrapped in plastic or covered in plastic, which is, I think, the way of being able to burn those with no, what's the technical word? coming out, <laughs> smoke or <laughs> pollutants coming out. So, so, there's, so there's concerns about burning. So what can you as supervisor do to make sure that either reduce the burning, eliminate the burning, or make sure that everybody follows the most sustainable way to do that? Brian, why don't you start this one? Yeah, sure, it's a great question. I'm, I'm not an expert on, on burning, but I do know that there's um, industries looking at this. There's a way to, uh, what do you call it, smokeless burning? So there are best practices for smokeless burning that everybody's using them. I don't know if our Farm Bureau and our industry are trying to get that message to industry that, that there's another way to do it. It's a little harder and it takes more time, but there is another way to do it. Um, and, you know, we all get complaints those days where there's burning happening, and it, it seems to all go towards Yonkville. Um, so Supervisor <laughs> Dillon gets, I said, she gets a lot of calls about this, so we worry about it. Uh, we, we work with industry, and uh, industry needs to do better at that, and they can. Um, but look at the alternative to, um, instead of burning, trucking that stuff out of here, and where does it go? So you gotta look at the balance of, of, of the impacts of dealing with these things, but um, we could do better. Okay, so uh, I have, um, as far as burning and, and just land management on a broad scale in general, we have a wonderful local resource, which is the uh, Resource Conservation District, and their whole goal is to work with, um, with people who are willing partners and to persuade people to become willing partners to do better management practices across our landscape. So I'd be really interested in seeing what the RCD could do through outreach and education and getting people on board. Um, that's something the more people you get, it kind of snowballs and you can have um, a, a really good effect that ends up being a landscape-wide management shift. And that's certainly happened really well in, um, in other areas, in, in Sassoon Marsh, which I've studied a lot, and also in Sonoma County, there's been a lot of good work done. So um, our RCD focuses a lot on education, but they could, um, and they do some outreach to land managers, but I think if they put a little more effort into that, we could do really well. Um, I also think we should be chipping and mulching more. I don't know about pulling things in trucks down to composting facilities. I've seen it happen in, um, in other counties with um, invasive weed projects that I've been on. We take the invasive weeds to the mulching facility and they turn it into compost, which is pretty awesome. But we didn't have to truck it very far. It was like a four mile trip. So this is a much bigger county. I'm not sure that's very realistic. Um, but yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell, the direction I'd be thinking of going. Certainly the concerns of smoke are a very valid point. Um, one, as Supervisor Gregory said, um, we have to continue to seek best practices, and that's actually where those plastic trucks come in, to reduce the moisture that goes into those piles so that when they are burned that it produces less smoke. So that's number one. Number two, we have a great partnership with the Bay Area Air Quality Control District. Um, and when we do have people that are violating the no burn days, uh, we do ask the inspectors to, to come out and to enforce that. Um, in regards to chipping, you know, one of the things, chipping has been utilized. However, we do have to be cautious. If we have diseased vines, um, they, do need to be, um, they do need to be burned. Chipping may not be an, an option. So if you were to have like a, mine, a vine mealy bug infestation, you have to treat that differently than just Old, old vines that need to be disposed of. Um, one of the things that we have done is we have increased our own shipping at the county for fire prevention, and certainly this is another opportunity for us to continue to utilize that program further and to seek the best practices going forward. We're well aware of the issues and, and we will continue to monitor that situation and ensure that our residents um, and their air quality is guarded. Okay, the next question I'm going to shift is um, related to water and clean water. And the comment is, we have pesticides from vineyards runoff in our groundwater and the Napa River. What, sh 
What should be done so that we have cleaner water? Okay. Um, so, uh, so there's a few things that you can do on landscape scale to, um, to have cleaner water. The first thing is to not pollute in the first place, right? So look at ways to reduce use of pesticides, um, sediment sources, uh, biological contaminants, which often come from animals, um, uh, and, and it, so on and so forth. Another thing that farms can do is have tailwater ponds, which I don't see a lot of in Napa County, but they're very successful um, where I've seen them used in the Central Valley. So, um, you know, I think looking at whether it's feasible to do tailwater ponds would be a really good idea. That's, um, that's a pond at the out drainage outlet of a field where the water can pool and um, just have some bioprocessing happen that cleans it up in place before it flows out into uh, r r uh, connected running waters um, that would transport whatever's in it. Uh, and, um, and beyond that, I think measuring and monitoring is really important. We don't do enough of that here, particularly in our water supply watersheds. So um, getting a measuring and monitoring system in place, I don't think it would even be that expensive at this point in time to do. But that's the basis by which you can then start to make smart decisions about where do we need to focus our attention. Um, and I think that would, that would go a long way to solving a lot of our water issues. Certainly watershed monitoring and the health of the watersheds um, is a priority and something that we acted upon just last year. In partnership with the city of Napa, um, we went ahead and identified locations within the watersheds that would be critical for us to monitor water quality. I look forward to being able to review that data when it comes forward and to make dis informed decisions that are science-based from that data. Um, certainly sediment, um, given we have hillsides and we have a river, sediment and the TMDL loads that occur in the river is something that we have to continue to monitor. Um, but, you know, it goes beyond that. The, the health of the watersheds, I, I think one of the most fascinating things I learned during the time of uh, the partnership with the city of Napa last year is that the city of New York purchased all of its watersheds. They purchased their watersheds. It's well within their control. Um, that would be a tremendous step in the right direction. So uh, to, the, to the extent possible, utilizing the land trust, utilizing the open space district, Tony, through Measure K, to be able to bond against it and purchase that open space so that we can continue to um, conserve the areas that, um, that directly feed into our municipal watersheds. Um, would be a, a, a great next step for us to continue the protection of water. Good points, both of you. You know, we can no longer guess at where that, where, where those issues are happening and why it's happening. Um, th this model we're building is, is it's really important. Uh, uh, Supervisor Ramos mentioned it in partnership with the city. We just uh, got into an MOU with them to add what, like 20 more monitoring stations this winter. So this winter we're collecting even more information to make this model better. It'll help us understand as land use changes what happens as it affects Lake Hennessy and uh, Milliken. Um, it'll also allow us to anticipate what future land use changes will do, meaning I think we can, it, once this model gets to a certain shape, we can use it to review entitlements. So this is, this is a big deal. And I know Mayor, El Mayor Ellsworth's back there, right? Uh, what we've been saying is that this, you know, we're building this protocol, this model for city of Napa municipal basins, but I think it then scales up to yours, Mayor Ellsworth, and those others up there that people are concerned about, to know what, what's happening there. The other is, is uh, the regional board um, is starting to require farm plans from all these existing vineyards. So in a few years, they're all going to have to monitor uh, during rain events, um, akin to erosion control monitoring during construction project. So they're going to have to go out there before a storm, set up a baseline, and after the storm, monitor uh, runoff. and. Um, if there's sediment or constituents in there, they're going to have to tell on themselves to the regional board and then correct it. So add that layer to this data we're gathering. Um, we're going to start to know what's happening and, and there'll be less guessing and, and then we'll move forward. So I'm going to kind of expand on the discussion you just had about um, air quality and burning. Um, if I remember correctly, in this room, the Air, the Bay Area quality people were talking about monitoring, except the monitoring is sitting like, I don't know, by the college or over here. Uh, <laughs> and so I guess, you know, so one of the things is, 
and I have one at my house, and so many people have, you can have individual monitoring stations. So, you know, what can the county do to kind of make sure maybe that monitoring is not just sitting in a very urban area where maybe the smoke from the from the burning doesn't. So is that something that the Board of Supervisors would be, is that in your jurisdiction to deal with? It is not within our jurisdiction, air quality reps with Bay Area Air Quality Control District. However, we do have a representative, a Supervisor Wagon Connect, and I'd be happy to, to relay that. You're right, there are those private monitoring stations that can give us um, better data, and there are apps that um, include that as well. And that is really good to have that app. I know I use it. Uh, because the college and Vallejo was not a good enough indicator for me because I certainly understood what, during fire, critical fire events that in American Canyon we had a different smoke pattern. So it's important for us from a public health standpoint. Um, I will say this, when we do incur, um, uh, when we are in a um, disaster declaration, whether it be for our own fire activity or for uh, trailing smoke, we do send out our public health department and they are monitoring in addition to just that one station that we have at Napa Valley College. So in those critical events, we are doing additional monitoring and that comes through our public health director, Karen Relucio. Dr. Karen Relucio. <laughs> Not much to add to that. Shout out to Supervisor Wagon Connect, who is our rep on the Air Quality Board. Um, and, and just to, there's about 40 commissions districts, things that we all sit on and we split them up. Uh, Supervisor Wright Connect, I think, often goes to San Francisco twice a month to, to the fair board meetings. Um, and so he's our rep and, and, um, and I think, you know, if he were here, he'd have a really good answer to that question. <laughs> all right, and um, I'm not totally clear what exactly the question was. Well, the question is, is it within the realm of the oh. supervisors? Because it's very difficult for some of us to know like which jurisdiction has responsibility. And so this was air quality monitoring. And so the answer so far was no. It's not within the purview of the board of supervisors, but the supervisor the supervisor wagon sits on the board of the air quality. So that that okay. Yeah, so I think it may have been sufficiently answered. I'll just kind of build on these comments by saying that the uh, California Air Boards do a great job and they have a beautiful cap and trade program that's really going to help with emissions statewide and uh, yeah anybody's curious about it you can talk to me later. Okay the next question actually has a few questions so I'm kind of related I'm going to bundle them together. Um, one question is um, this person is concerned about the abnormally high cancer rates for children and women and the other one is related to 5G network. There's a lot of discussion about what the impact of this 5G network and the small cell towers. So um, this is kind of a health-related issue. So I'm going to kind of throw that to you to say, you know, what what can we do um, to ensure the health of our citizens? Maybe throw on that a bit. Well, that's a really hard question, and I'll admit. Um, but that's your job. That's your job question. So. <laughs> so the health of our citizens is paramount, and um, there's been a lot of talk about, let's say, glyphosate, right? Um, and it turns out our industry voluntarily stopped using glyphosate a long while ago. Now, some might have continued to use it to some degree. Um, but I, I'm with you. So I, you know, I, I ride my bike a lot on Dry Creek Road on Beater, and I'm going by there, and I'm. I'm right on the shoulder, and there's a fellow next to me spraying something with a full suit mask on. It's like, where's my mask and suit, right? <laughs> so, I, it, you know, we, we need to be safe, and uh, I think we've got an industry that cares a lot, that's ahead of the curve in terms of um, farming safely um, and sustainably. I really do believe that, and um, uh, I, I don't. I can't speak to cancer rates uh, or the effect of 5G. There's a lot of debate around that, around that as you all know. But um, I'll, I'll always vote for the safety and health of my citizens above anything else. Okay. So uh, with uh, with regard to health and safety and uh, 5G and also air quality and with pesticides in there too, it's a big topic. So <laughs> so everything. Um, so. When I think about questions like this, I think it's easier to talk about where I'm coming from rather than what I do on any specific issue. And some of these aren't really under the view of the Board of Supervisors right now. It's more of a city issue or 
uh, whatnot. But, um, but the way that I kind of look at the 5G thing and sometimes with, um, with other, other issues that have come up in the community related to health is who, who benefits if you pass and say, yes, go ahead with the commercial development and who benefits if you don't. And I, you know, I do kind of have to question, um, you know, is there really this huge public outcry that we all must have 5G right now? Because I haven't heard that from anybody. You know, this is a company coming into our area saying, we want to have this here and this is the future. And they're basically selling us a bill of goods, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm not really, I'm, I'm personally not convinced that 5G is a, a terrible health risk, but I, I also don't see the demand for that technology coming from the community. And I think that's maybe the more important question. Um, yeah, so I think I'm almost out of time here, but uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So there's been a lot of comments. Uh, Can I go? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, please. Can I answer the question? Yes. Um, so um, to follow up a little bit on cancer rates, um, one of the things um, certainly there has, um, we've seen the data and we do have public health monitoring it and we do receive an annual report on any fluctuations and changes in that. So that is something that is before the board um, and Dr. Karen Relucio is monitoring that um, as part of the division of public health. Um, we haven't received any information um, that is um, alarming and that cre and that triggers the public health crisis standard for us, but it is on our radar and it is something that we are monitoring. Um, in regards to um, 5G and, and that, that issue coming before the city of Napa, um, you know, I'll say this. It's, it's a tough thing when you've got um, when you have um, infrastructure and communications and those infrastructure easements and entitlements that can go on to our public power poles and stuff. So one of the things that the city of Napa did do was to negotiate a better location um, that they found. I think it's imperative for all of us to do that cost benefit analysis and to engage with these utilities and to make sure that it works for our community. We have not had that issue at the Board of Supervisors, but that is something that I would be interested in making sure that we make sure it's the right location for us. Okay. <laughs> Next question uh, relates to, to water, um, I guess water sustainability and water supply and water security. And the question is, or the statement is, the state has warned that the Sierra snowpack is disappearing, and Napa cities heavily rely upon Sierra water, which comes from the North Bay Aqueduct. How will you ensure that the citizens have an adequate water supply? Okay, um, so that is correct, that we're pulling water off the North Bay Aqueduct at Barker Slough. Um, it's uh, not only reliant on Sierra snowpack, but it's also got water quality issues because it's a very slow moving part of uh, the delta as far as water movement goes. So it tends to be eutrophic, rich, and it can cost a lot of money to clean. And once you do all that, it has an off flavor that you might have noticed in your Napa water supply. So this is expensive water and it's insecure water. It's also at risk uh, from earthquakes, because if there's earthquakes which take out levees in the delta, it basically acts like a suction cup pulling uh, seawater inland, and within a few days you can lose uh, control of the salinity at that intake location. So this is a, actually a very fragile water source to be relying on it, and we're relying on it very heavily. So in order to have more local control over our water supplies, we really need to focus on keeping our water supply watersheds clean. We need to focus on urban inner ties with other locations as much as we possibly can. That's something that saved pre, um, in the previous drought, um, absolutely saved a few different uh, cities, um, which otherwise would have run out of water before the drought was over, but they had put inner ties in place beforehand, so they were able to transfer water from one county to another. And the last thing is groundwater, so the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and making sure that we have a valid stakeholder process to get us through that um, planning for groundwater sustainability going forward. And during my time on the city council, um, I had the unfortunate opportunity to have to deal with the reality of a 0% water allocation through the North Bay Aqueduct. 
the city of American Canyon is 100% uh, reliant on the North Bay Aqueduct. So imagine the surprise when we just had the uh, acre feet to carry over from the prior year in a zero allocation because of a drought, because of the the uh, declination of the Sierra snowpack. One of the things we need to do is we need to make sure that the potable water is reserved for us and not for um, ground uses such as watering your lawn. There's great opportunities to be able to increase our recycled water supply and we need to be able to do that. We need to make sure that we are monitoring our watersheds to continuously make sure that we have a high quality of water here because it is expensive to clean that water and when it when you don't have the allocations coming through or you have a shutdown at the transfer station it is incredibly expensive to go out into the market and to purchase water from the city of Vallejo from uh, or from other jurisdictions um, so we need to make sure that we are looking at other sources and that we're also investing in additional infrastructure and other reservoirs throughout the state so that we're not fully dependent on the aqueduct. True. <clears throat> and, uh, but, but first, the positive is we're blessed, at, except for American Canyon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of us are blessed with uh, a, an amazing supply of surface water. Uh, we're at a, an advantage over a lot of our neighboring cities and counties. In fact, a lot of times when our state water supply is uh, is at, at, at the allocation, we hardly touch water from Lake Hennessy, let's say, for example. So we're blessed with that and a healthy aquifer. We have 28 years of data showing our aquifer is healthy. Um, but we're exposed to risk over here with the state water project uh, uh, fluctuating year by year. Um, good chance to talk about some of the really amazing things we're doing in that sanitation district. I, I'm the county rep on that five-person board of directors. Uh, we've got another 10,000 10, acre feet per year to sell recycled water to sell of the MST area. We're out there encouraging folks to sign up. The pipe's there. Uh, we've got a whole lot of folks along the pipe that haven't connected and signed up yet. Um, so we, we're, always, uh, we're always going out and seeking more of those folks. And get this, at some point soon in the city of San Diego, uh, in a few years, 35% of their water supply will be direct potable readers, which means drinking, uh, drinking uh, our treated wastewater. And if you think about it, a lot of the water coming out of the, uh, the, the slough we're pulling out of has been in and out of a wastewater treatment system <laughs> many, many times. And so a lot of the water uh, that, we could, that we'd be delivering uh, it might be cleaner than the water we're pulling out of there. So um, the game's changing in uh, sanitation, and it's all about resource recovery, and I think net, and that the same will be a huge part of the puzzle moving forward. So the next question is, Kind of on the flip side of that, we were talking about having too little water, or potentially too, too, um, too little snowpack producing the water. Um, but now there's a question here that's talking about the effects of rising ocean levels, sea levels. Now we have too much water. Now we have some areas within the county, like on Milton Road and other areas. And so, what what would you do? What would you recommend? What what actions would you take? to deal with that before it becomes a crisis for those people who live near the ocean, near the river, or, or any, I guess any other areas that might be affected by the rising ocean. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're worried about it. Back to Navasan for a moment. We're one of the uh, wastewater treatment plants that's down as low out of flow as you go. Uh, so climate action, or uh, 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 sea, sea level rise is gonna affect us there first. And uh, we gotta do something about that at the treatment plant. And then just imagine as the issues move forward. Uh, I sit on the North Bay Watershed Association. Um, do any of you go to that meeting? Some of you might. Um, we got a, a, a report on the health of the estuary as it relates to sea level rise. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of hardening that's going to start happening along the edge of the bay. Uh, unfortunately, some of that will be truly hardening, like sea walls, but in a lot of places there's enough room to do uh, uh, berms, you know, it's a softer approach to, you know, protecting the edges of the, uh, the bay. Um, so there's a lot of thought being put in this right now. Um, but again, this this is going to hit Napa too. We've got to be ready. All right, so sea level rise. Um, Napa's in a relatively good position compared to other Bay Area counties for sea level rise, which is kind of amazing. Um, we definitely do have serious concern here as well. Uh, the entire flood control project was built without considering a meter higher of sea level. 
Um, it went through its planning process and got approved right before that became a rule that they would have to consider sea level rise. So it's built about a meter or two low to handle the tides we're likely to have going forward in the century, which is, <laughs> that's not good. So um, we definitely need to get ahead of that and like do some forward thinking planning about flood control. Again, I know it just feels like we just finished that, but um, we, didn't, we didn't consider sea level rise and that's, that's an issue. Um, also, uh, coming out of fish labs and thinking a lot about fish habitat in the estuary um, and being out on boats a lot, looking at the marshes, when the sea level rises, you have the potential to create new habitat for aquatic species and aquatic organisms. You have to give it space to happen, but it can be you know, an opportunity to let the marsh move across the landscape and, and go upslope a little bit. And we do have a few places in Napa County where that can happen. I think funding the open space district is a great way to go ahead and start acquiring those properties to make sure they're in place and they don't get developed. Um, the Napa Pipe Project, unfortunately, is in a marsh, uh, marsh transition zone. Um, or it would, it would have been a marsh transition zone if that gets built. I don't know how to phrase that. Um, and I think I'm just about out of time. But, um, but those are some of the things I'm thinking about with sea level rise locally. To add on what's already been said, I think we don't need to look any further than Highway 37. Highway 37, the levee failures and the subsidence of the road has really shocked us all. Um, and it, and that's not in Napa County, but it, it affects you. And it affects you because when that road fails, all the traffic is coming through Napa County. And my commute that was 45 minutes south suddenly became an hour and 17 minutes. And so we definitely are faced with this right now. While hardening is one solution, the other part is a very natural one, and that is wetland restoration. I serve on the Highway 37 Committee, and that's actually one of the things that we're balancing right now. Which part is appropriate for hardening and lifting and stands to allow the wetlands to naturally occur underneath? And which ones do we need to allow a more natural progression of, of the land and to understand how far these king tides, the, the, the super tides are going to come in and to plan appropriately. Hardening is not appropriate everywhere. And we need to look no further. And while, yes, we do have the, the concerns of sea level rise in, in relation to our, our restoration and our flood control project here, we need to look no further than here to realize that the land can heal itself and the land can do a lot. And so I look forward to continuing those discussions and elevating that specifically to Highway 37, which is our very near and real threat of sea level rise. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, the next question I'm going to tie into this um, is related to transportation. Um, so do you support alternate, alternative transportation that connects our entire county internally and to the larger Bay Area, and how would you promote this? I don't know what's going on outside. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I, I do support alternative modes of transportation. I think we have a lot of potential here. The cities in Napa County are relatively flat. Again, um, there's, there's jurisdictional things where, you know, as a county supervisor, you just can't just tell the city what to do. You have to partner and persuade and get conversations going. But uh, as a general principle, I absolutely support um, bike and pedestrian friendly uh, conversions, um, realignments of streets, uh, finding places where you can punch through a fence say and get an easement to make something much more walkable where you don't have to walk around the whole block instead of just right across to the store all that kind of stuff it seems like a small change but it can make a huge difference to connectivity for a community um, and i've seen wonderful examples in both sonoma county and uh, yolo county davis in yolo county is a very bike friendly city and that's not by accident it's by design and you really have to get ahead of it in the design process make sure that when you're uh, working with developers on a project that there's um, planned, connected bike paths and pedestrian paths that go um, between the project and locations of interest. And uh, <laughs> I'm pretty much out of time, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, that's kind of uh, my, my take on that. One of the um, great parts of being able to serve as the Vice President of ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, is that I have the opportunity to work closely with the other side of the house, the transportation side, through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And this is actually one of the things that we're looking at. How do we get people out of their cars? And also, how do we get them in the right locations of housing 
uh, centered around jobs and looking at those job centers and how we can incentivize people to do things a little bit differently. Um, we have a pilot program underway right now of Napa Forward to, with um, specific partners in hospitality and in, and in industry to be able to move people in a more carpool friendly way. That's one way of, of, of looking at this. But the, we've got a really real and near solution and that is we can bring SMART into Napa County. We can bring the SMART train over from uh, the Nevada side over and to create that connection over to Solano County. And that alone is gonna help us with the traffic on Highway 37. I think it could be very encouraging to create alternative mobility. It should be exciting to get on a train. And I look forward to the day in which we have the, that connectivity and that availability here in Napa County. I, uh, it is my sincere hope that uh, the Y train will um, continue to explore private commuter rail as well as an option um, that is an underutilized rail line within the county. And while it is privatized, I think that there are great opportunities for expanding that as an alternative method. Uh, good points. Yeah, just to add to some of that, uh, uh, SMART, um, knowing folks in um, Sonoma who use SMART, it's really changed their lives, especially those that live near a station. They can ride their bike to it, hop on go all the way down to Larkspur Ferry and go to the city. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. And the fact, or the idea that it could one day come over here and get some of us over that way is huge. Um, and that's being planned. Um, and then it's, and then the wine train, super important. I, I think we're, we're in a good place right now. The new owners of the wine train, if you haven't met them, Greg, Ron, Scott, Moldy, they're, they're great, they're community minded. I think they're interested as much as any of you in, in pedestrian or, uh, or passenger service. A lot of technical issues with that. Um, when you do that, you've got to, you know, certain crossings have to be protected so that it's not a cheap endeavor. But they're interested, and I think one day we'll do it. But we've got to figure out from the wine train how to get the mobility from there to all the points east and west. That's not easy in a county like ours, but it's worth a try. Vine trail is hugely important. Um, I was one of the founding members of the vine trail on the engineering committee. Actually, was a civil engineer for most of most of it until I got elected, and. and um, so much more to do there, but I think the vine trail is important to all of us. And little things like MBTA's buses, some of their longer commuter buses, not just within the valley, but those that go to Solano and Sonoma are Wi-Fi enabled. So a lot of folks use those, and they're in there. They got Wi-Fi, and they can work on the way to work. Um, so it's all these little things add up, but we got to keep keep uh, working hard at it. Thanks. I like some of the ideas you mentioned because I know in the meetings that I've been in. Um, Transportation uh, and the pollution from that has been high on the climate action plan. So there are some good ideas. Um, okay, so this this question here is talking about the new groundwater agency that the county has. The board of supervisors recently established a groundwater agency with the sole membership being the five of you, or them. Um, the state water department expects complete stakeholder participation. So the question is, how will you ensure that all stakeholders? And I presume a lot of people in this room um, are involved and heard. Um, certainly, we just did create uh, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency in, in December, our alternative plan. Although um, technically complete, uh, lacked the, the 10 year baseline data point, and for that reason was rejected, not a, not a reflection of the, of the health of the, of the basin itself. Um, but certainly this is a great opportunity to bring stakeholders together. Um, while the board does serve as the agency itself, um, it is incumbent upon us, it is a requirement that we have stakeholder engagement. Um, it is my hope also that we will move forward with the technical advisory committee because I think it is, uh, we've shown through the past, um, through having the GRAC, the groundwater, um, agent, the groundwater Committee that we had years ago that informed this process and we anticipated. We saw that we had the opportunity to bring differing viewpoints together and to work collaboratively and I think we have another great opportunity. Water is, we all need water. It's our survivability. It is the indicator of our, of the foundation of our health um, and in our in our lives each and every day. And so I think it's important for us to move forward in a way that is engaging of stakeholders and, um, and that is collaborative. And I look forward to doing that in this next year to come. Yeah, you know, we have, so we have two years now to, to, to uh, create our plan. 
and it's important to me that we get stakeholder input to do so correctly, the right way. Um, we'll continue to have WIC, by the way, because WIC is a much bigger sort of watershed focused group. They're focused on the hills, the valley floor, the whole system. Um, what we're looking at to set this advisory group up, whether we call it steering committee or an advisory group that's going to help us build the plan in the next two years, uh, we're looking at the map of the basin itself and who's in it, who are the stakeholders. It's uh, the cities, it's us, the county, special districts, uh, 40 special water districts or something that might be stakeholders. So we'll carefully craft what might become a steering committee to help us build this plan um, to where it represents all of all of you, all of the stakeholders that are within that map basin. And so absolutely we're going to do that. And uh, March 17th is the next meeting we have on this subject. And you're all invited. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is one area where I am going to disagree with the current supervisors. I don't believe the process that they have gone through to establish themselves as the groundwater sustainability agency for the county is appropriate. Um, it doesn't uh, follow the guidance laid out by the Department of Water Resources and the State Board, which clearly calls for a real stakeholder process, an authentic stakeholder process where everybody is an equal participant. Um, and uh, as far as my understanding of having attended the meetings and even just hearing your comments, um, I don't see where environmental water interests are going to be represented in this group. I don't understand how communities that are disadvantaged are going to be represented in this group appropriately and have an equal voice. And, uh, and I really think that this needs to go to a complete, um, you know, a proper stakeholder uh, kind of process where everybody has an equal voice and um, not only, uh, you know, just so that the power is balanced, but because that's ultimately the best way to bring people together in a community. And, uh, you know, people um, who are involved in the flood management project here in Napa uh, understand that you know that was not an easy process to get through but by the time it was done it was a really wonderful thing that ended up bringing the community together and that's what stakeholder processes are they're not easy at the outset but in the end the result makes the community stronger and that's another reason why I think that's a better way to go about this planning process for groundwater in our community the next questions, actually there's a few questions here that I'm going to bundle together, are related to plastics and single-use plastic. Um, I guess I would say, uh, I'm not sure if San Francisco is the only city, but I know that some communities are being quite bold. They make you rent a glass at Starbucks, or bring, so that there are, there's no paper involved as well. Um, I've seen some discussions where what would life be like if you didn't have garbage pails? Okay, so I mean, so I, I'm going to kind of expand on some of these questions here about voluntary isn't enough. How bold can we get? How bold can you get when it's on the issue of plastics and single use plastic bags or cups? And I have glasses here for you today, just because yeah. I was very <laughs> conscious that there's water in this. Thing. I knew it was rough. <laughs> Uh, well, we can always do more. At the county last year, we banned uh, single-use plastic water bottles. We don't use those at the county anymore for our function or events. Um, what's more to do? Uh, what else? What else can we do? Um, um, uh, you know, a lot more uh, as this as this evolves uh, and as our climate action plan evolves. Uh, look forward to studying what else we need to do as a county. Um, I talked a lot about sanitation so far, but plastics is such an issue for the wastewater stream, by the way, because that's where it's entering our waterways in, in, in a lot of places, in a lot of ways, and places. Uh, the, the industry is getting so creative. Like what I told you, is sanitation districts are becoming a oh, resource recovery district. Uh, they're actually taking methane and, and venting uh, biodegradable plastic uh, as an industry, because it's, it's a problem that affects them so much as an industry. They're using the methane that's coming off some of their uh, some of their biosolids and uh, inventing plastic that will be biodegradable. So you got a lot of creative people out there doing really creative things, and I think the future is bright. Okay. Um, again, I'm not 100% clear on the question. Like question part so of it. So the question is, um, <laughs> what what, what would you recommend to have bold solutions for okay. Napa County? Okay. As it, as it relates to plastic bags or single-use plastic. Okay, great. 
Um, so one thing that I've noticed uh, uh, a lot lately is that I'll have something to recycle and there's actually nowhere to put it. So it can be as simple as having a um, dispersed recycling program where it's relatively easy to find a place to put your recycling, your compost, you know, your paper, depending on if it's single stream or we need to be separating it. Um, just making it easier to recycle, number one. Um, and I, you know, I think there's a lot of room for, um, for uh, and, and something that we can look to other communities to see what's already been done as far as dealing with food waste more appropriately. Um, food waste is a huge source of methane and greenhouse gases. And there's some good conversations going on about that in Napa County right now. But um, I think as much as the county could be a partner to that would be really good. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, for single use plastics, um, obviously a big environmental concern. I've done plenty of creek cleanups in my life. I know it's out there um, all over the place and that's not a good situation. So. Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to, <laughs> okay, um, I, <laughs> I would have to look at um, what are the appropriate um, thing, steps to take that are going to work and not be um, prohibitive to people just getting through their days, right? Um, but at some point as a society, we've got to start transitioning away from the single use and um, throw away product kind of stuff. It's just, it's just not good um, practice. Beyond making uh, recycling uh, more accessible in, in all places, one of the things we actually need to look at is, is changing our culture around single-use plastics. And the reason is when you follow the stream, there is no end point for these plastics. Um, there are fewer opportunities to dispose and recycle of these plastics. And that is going to become a, a great concern at our landfills, and it all is already a concern at our landfills. So one of it is changed behaviors. That is a big one. Um, you know, I think we can do. Um, I personally would love to see that we we change our use of, of plastic straws. Um, but again, in order to be effective, I think we need to do this at a regional level, much like we. Uh, approached our single-use plastic reduction ordinance where it was the county and all of the cities together. I think that this is a great opportunity to utilize the uh, climate uh, regional committee that we have uh, with the cities, the town, and the county to be able to do that. Um, I can say personally one of the things uh, my children and I did this year is our New Year's resolution. We made a, a pledge to change one behavior each month. And so last month we moved to metal straws. And um, we've enjoyed that. They're pink and orange. And this month we are uh, not going to be using disposable cups when we go and pick up our coffee and our iced teas and lemonades uh, at our favorite little shops. So it starts individually, but we can do something collectively as well. All right, the next, the next question, and there's actually a few that are tied together um, about solar. Okay, I, think, I, I know as a realtor that um, the rules have changed and now all new homes, constructions, have to have solar panels on their roof or, or at least roof tiles that are solar. Um, but somebody is concerned that PG&E, um, says I was told PG&E pays 14 cents per unit for the system, for the energy that my house might generate, but I'm told PG&E charges 41 cents for what I use. It basically, it seems we're financing PG&E profits. Is there any truth to this? So that's part, one part of the question. And then the other part is, how can we take advantage of the fact that we will have a lot more solar panels on homes now? So I'm kind of tie that together because it, it's kind of an option, in, or it has been an option, but it will on the construction be a requirement. Okay, so uh, to start with, I can definitely see why as a as somebody who has solar panels and is selling that energy to PG&E and then PG&E is going ahead and doing a big markup on it, right? It feels like they're taking money. Um, you know, I would have to research that and see how much money they're actually generating off of that because obviously they're maintaining the power grid and they're in bankruptcy right now and there's all kinds of problems with PG&E. So, um, you know, it's, it's really hard for me you know, not, not having that question beforehand to have a, any kind of coherent statement to make about how much money they might be making off of your solar panels. 
Um, but uh, as far the second part was um, interconnected solar grids, I think uh, kind of a, um, the idea. I'm so what else, how best can we capitalize on the fact that we're going to yeah. have a lot more solar panels, or at least, I, I believe they don't have to be on every house, but if it's an apartment building, you could have a um, solar grid on the ground or an, over a parking lot or something as well. Right, so um, so that's great. The more energy we can dis create in a dispersed way rather than a centralized way, I think is a big plus. Um, the hard part is having battery storage for that energy because batteries are expensive, they're toxic, they have limited lifespans, all that stuff. So I think batteries are kind of the holdup in solar. I'm sure most of us are aware of that. But um, I've also heard some really good ideas about making interconnected local grids where you are sharing power um, within a limited area right so you might take a city neighborhood or a small town like rutherford or something and just make that um kind of a local interconnected mini grid and i think that's definitely something to talk about for our communities um that was one other thing i was going to say <laughs> but, uh, i know don't look at you but um uh i guess i'll have to pass this on thank you Certainly when it um, comes to the, the price of pg and &E, I'll say that there, there are two components of electricity and that is generation and transmission. So I'm not um, certain as to the, the breakdown of the, the cost, but um, they are two separate costs. And since we do have MCE, we are in MCE County here, you will actually see that break up between generation and transmission on your electricity bill. So that that's one, one thing that would, um, I, be happy to look into it further. When it comes to solar and the utilization, certainly um, utilizing those battery backups is going to be one way. There are concerns with it and the longevity of it, but that's one way to be able to capitalize on the solar that we have. The other part um, that I want to um, share with you is uh, we have created uh, the first uh, commercial solar site here in Napa County in American Canyon. And that there's a lot of controversy associated with that. Um, it was uh, the fifth district was the hotbed of this. And so it really caused us to elevate the discussion and adopt a renewable energy ordinance, which I'm proud to say that we did. And one of the things we've done is we've looked at some areas that can be um, kind of pre-zoned, if you will, for, for renewable energies and looking at um, making it easier and, and stating our preference for making sure we utilize solar on top of parking uh, spots and on top of buildings. Um, anything that we can do to create those renewable energy sources, we're doing through that renewable energy ordinance, something that had not been revised ever. Uh, solar is great. We've all been waiting for this 2020 California building code update. We knew this was coming that solar is now required. The last update simply made you pump for it. Now it's actually required to put the panels on your roof. It's a big deal, it's huge. I think the best thing that's gonna come from all this new solar, and I think that's the question, is helping us set up microgrids because we've got, from what I hear, another 10 years of BSPS before PG&E's figured their stuff out. Um, and PSPS, PS, no, I said PSPS, but it works both ways. It works both ways. How many people have a PSPS? So, so it's, it's going to allow us to set up microgrids, which are really, all there is to it is just our own little independent grid of electricity. We don't need pg &E. Okay, shut your stuff off, off. We'll be okay on our own. Um, the pg &E's idea right now of setting up microgrids is bringing in the diesel generators to certain communities. And we just heard this morning that I think they, you know, the, all, all, our entire region are looking at only 28 spots, and their vision of a microgrid is uh, trucking and diesel generators, so they'll try to power these substations. That's their idea of it. So this new solar is going to let us, get, and I think we're going to have to lead on this, not pg e but um, that's the real opportunity with the solar. Okay, the next question is um, talking about development, and I'm going to expand a little on this request. It says, will you, or do you support the development of hotels and restaurants in the counties on incorporated air. And I'm gonna tie that into the discussion of groundwater and what is the priority for groundwater and do you see hotels and restaurants using groundwater? You know, one of, um, one of the things that we're incredibly blessed with here is that um, 51 years ago, the citizens of Napa County had the foresight to say that 
they were going to preserve our land for agriculture and thereafter agriculture and open space and that resulted in the ag preserve and the ag watershed open space zoning designations and our agricultural resource designations within the general plan there are a few limited spots in which commercial activities can take place in, in the county and they are zoned in that way. Um, and so that, that is the area in which that type of development can, can occur. Um, it's, it's limited, few and far between. And in addition, we also have our industrial area to the south. When it comes to the uses of, of groundwater, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we are prioritizing uses. We've, we've said that groundwater is for agricultural purposes. It's also for um, personal consumption through, through houses. So it requires us to get a little more creative um, and, and looking at that and working with any development that is uh, zoned appropriately in that area to uh, push the discussion uh, for recycled water, to push the discussion for treatment of water on site so that it can be turned around and used into the landscaping. And we've done that and we've had some difficult discussions, but, uh, but we've done that. It's important to make sure that we, we live within our means and, and that is something that we continuously look forward to and we uh, engage the development process and those development agreements where appropriate to push that discussion and make sure that the county is benefiting overall. You know, Nab Napa Valley, the unincorporated area, except for some of our corporate centers, is reserved for agriculture, period, with a few exceptions. These six or seven park parcels sprinkled around the valley, uh, zone CL, there's, the universe is really small, and you have to look at each one differently and separately. Uh, let's talk about the Oak Knoll Hotel that was just um, approved by our planning commission. Um, at the old right hand, the Zare, uh, it's been dilapidated uh, for years, just sitting there. Um, a well-designed project, in, in, in my humble opinion, um, as an alternative to what they could have put back, which is a big old restaurant, a bunch of commercial and retail, which would have caused way more impacts than the project was proposed. So you gotta look at that. Um, also, they're on city water. Um, they're adjacent to the big city water main that connects Lake Fantasy to our community. Um, they're not drawing down groundwater for the project. That was important to me too, it's not quite about this project. Uh, so this one's very unique. Will we see another one out there that, 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 that it will be relying on groundwater and have issues? Maybe. And we'll have to think about that one very differently. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, maybe reinterpret this question a little bit. I'll just be upfront that I'm doing it. I think that the questioner might be getting at the erosion of the winery definition ordinance. And uh, maybe it's, um, they're not talking about restaurants proper, but food and wine pairings in the Ag Preserve. Does that sound, I don't know whose question this is, but if it was your question, does anybody want to hear an answer to that? Because I think, well, no, I just think that might be what they're getting at. It, you know, so, um, so I guess I'll just say that. Um, just give us your perspective on that. Okay. So, um, so I am very concerned about the erosion of the winery definition ordinance and redefining, uh, I, I'm being upfront about the fact that I'm redefining the question, but, um, but uh, uh, I'm concerned about the uh, redefinition of the winery, uh, winery wow, um, tongue tied, um, the winery definition ordinance and the erosion of it because it does mean that we're having impacts that were never intended in the ag preserve. Um, with uh, the types of jobs that are involved, the housing for those workers not being available nearby, with um, changes in patterns of tourists spending money and then maybe going out and just staying at a location in the valley floor and never needing to go to town for anything so the businesses in town aren't getting the same foot traffic they used to. I mean, these are concerns I'm hearing as I'm moving around the valley talking to people. And, um, and it affects our quality of life and the way this place is perceived. So, um, so I think those are all very real issues that the community is talking about already, and I, I you know, I, I welcome a continuation of that conversation because it's important. Uh, the Ag Preserve was a really visionary um, thing to adopt, as was the Winery Definition Ordinance, and if we're changing those things over time to react to perceived shifts in the market without thinking strategically, because the, sh the way the Winery Definition Ordinance was restructured to allow for more food pairings was a response to the um, changes in the market and, uh, and now those things are changing again. So, um, so I'm just not sure it was a well thought out shift. And let me, let, we'll just go back down and address the food wine pairings. Sure. Yeah. 
It's, it's a very uh, different question than the one yeah. I heard answered, and that's okay. It's a good question. <laughs> Glad you invented it. That's okay. This is, um, this is, a, very fluid, <laughs> this is a very fluid process so, here. <laughs> there was an amendment in 2010 to the WDO that allowed expanded food line pairings, right? I was like you watching from afar, you know, watch, watching our elected leaders do this in response to market conditions yeah. and a struggling industry, for sure. Uh, I think it taught us a lesson because the unintended consequence is um, we now have restaurants offering menus uh, and they're appearing on DoorDash. That wasn't the intent. So this has become a code enforcement uh, compliance issue for us. W one more on top of all the other ones we have. The good news is there's only about 30 high-risk kitchens um, that are uh, doing this kind of activity that, so the universe is small in terms of those we've got to go out and do compliance on, but we intend to, because some of them are taking it too far. And I'll tell you what, you got an industry who agrees. You got an Valley vendors who agrees that there's a few bad actors um, causing a lot of problems for everybody else. I, so can I, can I add to that, if you go to um, TripAdvisor, some of those online services, and it has the top 10 restaurants, and at one point, number one, or the winery, which was like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, Eve, Eve sends us every one of them by email. So. <laughs> I do. Well, I let you know when I find out. And Eve, yes, cut, to, wait, Eve cut into Ryan. You have 20 more seconds. Um, uh, oh, that's okay. That's okay. okay. Oh, good. Sorry. <laughs> you know, one of the things that is uh, important is the is the cooperation and collaboration with citizens like you to tell us when these things are happening. Um, we uh, cannot be everywhere at all times. Our code enforcement staff is mighty, but it is small. And so this is where it's incumbent for people to tell us what they see. I remember uh, I went as part of the food council to go to B Cellars. And I walked into B Cellars and I was introduced to their chef. I was told what wonderful things their chef was going to cook up for me, how I came from the garden, and not at one moment did anyone tell me about the wine that was being paired with it. We went ahead and enforced on these sellers because there comes a point where the food became more important than the wine. That's not what we're here for. While it is uh, great to be able to tout our, our locally sourced foods and, and to, to pair it with wines, uh, the intention of the WDO was to make wine and its education paramount. And so we are committed to that and, and to making sure that these uh, few bad actors are brought into compliance. It gives everybody else a bad name. We certainly want to be able to keep our position as a strong agricultural region with a great legacy. And so we happen to serve food, but not let that ever take over what we do well here in Napa County. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we can be flexible here because we, <laughs> I control the agenda, right? And you <laughs> control the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> Do you want to add anything? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to um, a, a different component. We haven't talked about that yet, and that is um, the the benefit of trees and the sequestration that they provide. And um, and we've had projects that have been permitted to cut down tens of thousands of trees. So I'd like to spend two different questions are saying are pretty much asking what's your position about going forward are we going to have the new development that is allowed to cut down trees and I guess I would add a little bit to that is that sometimes when we cut down these trees we're preserving the others well the others were already there so it's so like why don't we add some to the bank? so I just kind of want to just get your position on tree protection um, maybe even uh, a direction of having a area where it's replanted with trees where maybe over the centuries it, it has been deforested either on its own or for other reasons. Yeah, it, you know, really in response to Measure C, um, last year we uh, pursued water quality tree protection ordinance. It was the first time in 15 years we'd opened up the conservation regulations and looked at them, and we looked at it through the lens of what we just heard from you all through Measure C, um, the things you wanted, the things that made a lot of sense, the things that were controversial. 
Um, we've accomplished, uh, I, I felt, uh, what was maybe to you an incremental update to our conservation regulations. Maybe that's all it is. But for me, it's, it's a significant inch forward uh, or increment forward, however you look at it. Uh, we increased a, a mitigation from two to one to three to one in a lot of places. Um, we added the class three stream setback, which will preserve a lot more trees in those corridors. We do a lot of the common sense things that CEQA, frankly, CEQA requires these days anyways. And these are things that were part of Measure C. Um, so it's that increment forward. Uh, the ink's hardly dry on it. Um, I, I'm not sure, maybe we've got one or two projects that have been submitted under the new policy so far. So we're gonna see how it works. The other thing we gotta work on though, are folks that are mitigating are choosing to do conservation <coughs> easements and not to replant, because it's, it's fairly hard to plant oaks and have any kind of reasonable survival, survival ability rate. Uh, as part of North Bay Watershed Association, we funded a pilot project. They're looking at developing best practices for actually planting, replanting trees, and, and their survivability rates up in the 80% right now. They're figuring out different ways to do it. So uh, I, wanna, I wanna start to encourage that at the policy level, the replanting, not just the conservation. So we actually get trees back. And, and uh, I think we'll get there. Okay, so the adoption of the Water Quality Tree Protection Ordinance, the genesis of that was to try to find some kind of middle ground between Measure C and the pressure for more development in the county and the hillsides for conversion of wildland to vineyard. And I did a, like a 60 page report on this, so you can definitely look that up if you wanna see my complete opinion. But um, what I found out when I looked at the Water Quality Tree Protection Ordinance language is that it's a two to 3% increase over existing protections for trees. It does not um, have a substantial increase in protections for chaparral or for grassland cover types, which both store more ca carbon than vineyards do and which are the predominant land cover types of our water supply watersheds. You could save every tree in this county and our water supply watersheds would still have significant risk of sediment loading due to future development by conversion of wildlands to vineyards. So um, I really don't, you know, in, in syst systematically looking at the landscape and how it's arranged, I don't believe that the Water Quality Tree Protection Ordinance does the kinds of things that were behind what Measure C was trying to do. And I also think that the language of Measure C um, was very well intentioned, but um, people who we're working on that, hadn't looked at what the actual land cover was in the watersheds, and that's really important. It's chaparral and grassland predominantly in most of them. And so we really need to look at those land cover types when we're doing planning there. Um, the other thing about this is that for all of the controversy over conversion of wildlands to vineyards in the hillsides, we're losing vineyard land on the valley floor almost as fast as we're adding it in the hillsides because of our conversion to from vineyard to um, commercial uses and urban uses on the valley floor. And I think that needs to be part of this discussion as well. I heard a lot. Can you please repeat the question? Uh, okay. <laughs> Why are you going to go with the question? The question was um, related to um, removal of trees and sh uh, should we be encouraging planting versus both? <coughs> What's your position on vineyard development that requires, that says, I need to build here, and I need to cut down all these trees to do that? Is this really the direction that we want to be going forward in this climate crisis? The direction um, is, is one that it has to be about balance. It, it certainly has to be about prioritizing our quality of life and, um, and our environment, and to bring balance as we move forward um, with the statements that have been made uh, by generations before mine that agriculture is the highest and best use of the land in, in Napa County. One of the things, um, while uh, with the adoption of the Water Quality and Tree Protection Ordinance, um, what Supervisor Gregory said, I'll add on a couple of things. We did some things that were not defined before. We defined what a tree canopy was. We included protections for all trees, all native trees, not just oak woodland. And so that was a real great step in the right direction. Um, increasing the mitigations and, and, and creating those opportunities and incentives for on-site mitigation and for conservation easements as well. 
Um, the ink is not dry, and so it's important for us to be able to to reflect back, and that's the beauty of an ordinance adopted by the board, that if there are unintended consequences, we can go and fix them. Things I'd like to see moving forward, um, not just in addition to the, re, to the replants and making that more successful, we need to make sure that we, we map out our wildlife corridors so that the areas that we are preserving are actually meaningful and they have the highest biodiversity value to us overall. We haven't done that, and so instead of looking at things in isolation, We've got to look at it overall, and we have to hire a biologist to help us do that. So um, the next question is um, relates to a more sustainable um, agricultural county, and how can we incentivize an ag economy that is not focused on one crop? Now, it's interesting not one person in this room has used the word cannabis. Um, but <laughs> what they, they say, rather than maybe using, um, including food crops. And I would kind of maybe expand that to, as we have temperature rising, you know, what should we be doing? I mean, I know the vineyards are dealing with, you know, and replanting, and they're buying land in cooler spots. But for the land that's here, you know, how do we balance <coughs> our agricultural we don't want to see that paved over, so what can we do to diversify that so that we have a stronger economic base as well as a healthier community? It's a, it's a tough problem, or, it, 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 or, or opportunity, let's just say. Um, we get our crop report every year, we just got it a little while ago, and yeah, fruits and nuts every year drop, uh, and um, livestock drop, uh, because it's still a pig farm up there, north of Calistoga. Um, it's, it's tough for those land uses to compete. Uh, we have a local food advisory <coughs> council who's looking hard at this. They're a council of the county that's looking at uh, how to build more local food sources and farms. They're looking a lot more, though, at disadvantaged communities and urban settings. So we're looking at policies that will encourage urban projects, affordable housing projects, to put in uh, uh, platter boxes and start to uh, grow their own food uh, for more food security issues. So we look at some of that stuff policy-wise, but it, it tends to be focused around disadvantaged communities. Um, cannabis, <laughs> I'm, not, you know, I'm not sure how that fits in our community, if, it's a, if it's a, it has a future for us. I think a lot of you who voted for Prop 64 uh, want access, you want a place to go buy it close to home. Right, come on. <laughs> you like. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, whether we need to grow it here or not, uh, I can tell you we don't need to grow it here to make sure dispensaries, uh, shelves are stocked. We, we don't need to. Could we? Uh, is there a way to do it here? Maybe. But um, we'll be exploring that this year. Our first community session on that, at that coming up the March 25th. So there's going to be a lot of talk about that this year. Okay, so I can tell you one thing for sure is if we don't get ahead of it and do some planning, uh, the weather's going to drive the planning for us, right? And changes in the market will result in changes over time anyway in our land use. Um, we're projected to have a climate, depending on whose, whose projections you look at, maybe more like Southern California, maybe more like Redding over the next hundred years. And those aren't currently premium wine growing regions for the most part, maybe some around Santa Barbara. But um, uh, we're looking at having a hotter, drier climate with flashier storms. So um, thinking about crops that would succeed in those conditions, you know, that's what I would suggest to anybody who's trying to figure out how they can make a go of it here in the long term. Um, we're still doing okay with grapes right now, but I think that's going to become a bumpier situation as we go forward into the century. Uh, and I, um, I'm in support of aligning Napa County's rules with state laws on cannabis, and um, I think we have to do it very carefully because certainly you can overdo it um, and have uh, too much growing happening in a region. I think anybody who's been through small towns on the North Coast um, or, and compared the changes over the last 30 years can see what happens when you just kind of let it go um, a little too far. And I don't think that's a good thing for this community. And we need to definitely keep a tight rein on it to make sure it's not out of hand. But at the same time, you know, I think in some limited capacity, it could work. So. The impacts of climate change are going to first hit us in our food supply. 
Food insecurity is not simply whether you can get food. It's going to actually turn into whether we can grow the food. I am proud to be the board's liaison to the Food Council here in Napa, working with local farmers and policymakers to make sure that we are looking at the appropriate areas where we can use those smaller plots of land, half acre, one acre, to locally source foods and to first address the food insecurity that is ever present in our most vulnerable community, but to also then look forward to how do we address food insecurity during a disaster, which we all felt, not just during the fires, but also during uh, the PSPS activities um, that we have had in the last couple of years. But to use that model to go forward and to create a path of sustainability and really survivability for us, it's really important that we address food uh, sourcing as part of um, our platform and I look forward to the next steps of what the Food Council will bring for the board um, for legislative movement to make sure that we are charting our own course in that, in, in that area. It's uh, just as important as our water source, as our food sources. So we are right at 8 o'clock. Um, you want to answer a few more questions if the audience wants to stay a little bit longer? What, well, what, are you asking us if we want to answer more questions? Well, well <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got to go check some phone Okay. <laughs> Maybe one more question? One. Okay, one more question. Okay, so this one is um, related to the causes of global warming. We're, you know, we've been talking about climate crisis and the cause of global warming, and there's some um, uncertainty as what is the cause of global warming, and uh, how do we stop it? And I guess I would look at more locally. What are the things that we're doing that are contributing directly to that, as opposed to just maybe the problem is, you know, in another state or another country, but it affects the world. So I'm going to just localize that and say, is there something we're doing specifically that's making it worse? And what can we do to turn around and reverse that? I think the, the thing that comes to mind first is the, the easiest thing to fix is to not just, um, you know, kind of continue down the road we're on with all the momentum we have without reconsidering and making some serious changes. Napa County has the potential to be a leader in climate. We've already been a leader in land conservation and preservation. The only reason we have this beautiful open landscape that's, um, you know, open fields and hillsides that aren't covered in houses is because we have the viewshed ordinance, because we have the ag preserve that's been fiercely defended over time, um, because we have the hillside ordinance um, doing a lot of the heavy lifting on preserving our wildlands out in the, um, in the mountainous areas. So I would say having that kind of visionary planning and being um, just being comfortable being a leader and stepping out and saying, we're, we're going to get it right, we're going to do it here, we're not waiting for other people um, is one of the main things we can do. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> In addition to uh, creating um, our climate action plan, our regional climate action plan, and acting upon it, that's the most important. It's not just a matter of the adoption, but it's actually following through and holding ourselves accountable for it. The greatest impact in which we can have uh, on reversing the effects of climate change is our food choices. Our food choices and, and, and the greenhouse gas emissions that come from our food choices is one of the biggest impacts that we can have. Checking in with yourself, um, if there, is, um, there is a list, it's a readily available list um, that will tell you what your, what your carbon footprint impact is when you make choices in food from reducing beef to strawberries and lettuce and, and they tell you which, which foods to make better choices of. And uh, you know, I'm I, I'm very very lucky to have um, such thoughtful children um, that look at it that and say, "Mommy, we need to we need to make a different choice." And in fact, we do make those choices. So I hope that we create a climate action plan that is measurable, aspirational, we can follow through on, but that we individually take on the responsibility of making personal changes that are going to have a positive impact for all of our survivability. It's a great wrap up question because it brings up so many different things, right? So we need a climate action plan that's real, that has meaningful measures that will work. Uh, I remember early on in my term, 
we were looking at an early version of this thing three years ago. And um, the plan at that time aspired to um, electric tractors for the farm industry. And they hadn't invented those yet. <laughs> they don't exist. So it's cool to aspire to that, but it's not something we can act on immediately, right? So it's got to be real. It's got to be uh, actionable, measurable. Um, Low-hanging fruit for us is cars and buildings. We know that. That's why it's so good that we're working with the cities now, because a lot of the urban stuff is happening in the cities. Um, and then just in general, the jobs housing problem. Senator Weiner, who's the, uh, the uh, uh, committee chair, uh, chair of the Senate Housing Committee, says it best is we've created a monster. We've created super commuters. And he really blames local government for screwing up the uh, housing business. We've been NIMBY for way too long. So he squarely blames cities, a little bit of counties, but mainly cities, because uh, that's where most of it happens, for, for, for screwing this up. That's why they're starting to uh, uh, implement mandates for us, which is if we don't get it right, they're going to start uh, uh, taking control out of our hands. Right. So the game's changing there, and so local government has a chance to step up on the jobs housing imbalance, uh, which is a big part of it. But lots, lots of uh, work to do, uh, and I'm pleased to get another turn to do it. Okay. I think we make a round of applause.